Okay, welcome everyone to our panel tonight on energy democracy and climate justice at the Future for All conference. Um, the panel is called Power for the Future for All, the question of energy, and we have uh, three fantastic guests with us tonight on an all-female panel, which is also really great, um, joining us for a conversation about the future of the energy system in a hopefully utopian uh, 2048. Uh, uh, my name is Linda, Linda Schneider. I work with the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Berlin. Um, and I'm also um, active in the climate justice movement in Germany um, and in the Right to the City movement in, in Berlin. And I will, um, will facilitate tonight's um, panel. Um, I will tell you a bit more about uh, our panelists in a second. Um, for those of you who need um, German translation um, of the panel, because all of this will be held in English, um, so it's easier for us um, on the panel to, to communicate. Um, for those of you who need German translation, you can click on, um, on the link that's posted in the chat box um, in where this is being streamed. And please make sure to open it in a new tab, because otherwise uh, this, like what you're seeing right now, will be closed. So just open it in a, in a new tab. Um, right, so as I said, we have three great uh, speakers with, that, with us tonight. Um, I'll just go, uh, go through them. Um, first is Libo Hang Mulesi. Uh, with COSATU. She's um, uh, the Labour Market Policy Coordinator for COSATU, which is uh, the Congress of South Africa's uh, Trade Unions. And she develops um, COSATU's policy uh, positions on labour market topics, including uh, just transition to a low-carbon economy. Um, hi, Lebo. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Linda. Um, next, uh, we have Nui Khan. Um, she's um, the founder and um, also the executive director of uh, Green Innovation and Development Center, Green ID. And um, she has, um, since 2012, she has led Green ID to, to champion local energy planning um, and has demonstrated the multiple benefits of sustainable energy solutions for households and um, for communities and for society. And she's also the first uh, Vietnamese, she's from Vietnam, uh, could have said that. Um, um, she's also the first Vietnamese Goldman Environmental Prize recipient in 2018. Hi, Hang. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Nina. Hi, Hi, everyone. Also, it's great that you joined because it's already quite late in Vietnam, we have to say. And uh, finally, there's Toni Naushin. Um, she's a climate activist from, uh, from Bangladesh with a, with a background in economics. And she currently works with um, the German NGO Urgewalt, uh, which many of you might know watching this right now. And she has previously worked with organizations like ActionAid and 350. And her focus is on coal exit and divestment. Hi, Toni. <laughs> okay. Um, so as I said, this panel tonight is about the future of the energy system. We're hoping, um, obviously, to uh, to live in a different energy system in 2048, which is another, you know, 28 years from now. The energy system is definitely one of the first, um, you know, broader um, well, sectors um, of the economy that has to uh, transform a lot for us to... Um, you know, prevent the worst of um, of the climate impacts. Um, it's you know, it's really the foundation of of our economy today. So the question of energy production, um, energy consumption, the um, the sources of our energy is really at the really at the heart of the climate crisis and also of the transformation that we need to to undergo as societies and as economies. Um, and at the same time. Today and for the you know for the past decades and centuries probably, um, the energy system has also been you know a major driver obviously of the climate crisis but also of um, you know of ex exploitation of violent conflicts in in many locations, and um, still today a lot of people continue to be excluded from energy ac access. Um, so I guess starting from where we are at right now in 2020, um, we would like to discuss with um, 
our three panelists um, how you know a utopian future energy system could look like and how the path uh, towards that could look like um, and also you know how we how we can shape that path um, together and what that system can look like and how we can you know both address climate change but also meet people's need in this energy system so the question that we would like to start with is uh, something perhaps a bit anecdotal. Um, so we're trying to really visualize um, a utopian energy system in almost 30 years. So if you, if you could just imagine, you know, it is the year 2048, we're almost mid-century. We're imagining that the world has successfully transitioned away from fossil fuels. And I would like to ask you sort of, if you look out the window, what do you see? Like, what is different from today? How can you tell that we're not in, you know, COVID-19 plagued 2020, but we're actually in, in a better future in 2048? Like, what is, how can you make that tangible for, um, for people viewing this? How do you see, what does this look like, the utopia? Um, Tony, if you would like to start. Thank you. Um... I think I would start from, uh, one second, I'm having an echo, do, um, wait, I just try to, um, yeah, uh, I think I would start from the point that, first of all, of course, uh, for any reality to come, like any um, expected outcome to become reality, we need to have a imagination. But at the same time, I think it's also absolutely important that we do not undermine the struggle we would need to reach, uh, achieve that utopia. So for uh, in terms of the, the, the current problem, the crisis we are facing as it is uh, a result of the way we have been organizing and using our energy. And at the core of it, I believe, would be to drastically reorganize um, the way we have been living, producing, and that would also have an impact on the around energy. And for that, it would mean that we are uh, ideally, like I could say that I look out of the window and probably not wanting to see a lot of industrial um, infrastructure, uh, maybe imagining we, I mean, I'm, I'm a degrowth activist. So in, I always love to introduce myself as a degrowth and climate justice activist. And from that perspective, um, I believe we as a human civilization, we would need to reduce the whole economic size and the way we are living on this planet and we would need to engage with the environment and how we live very differently so for, in my imagination i would imagine that a lot of greenery already like our housing at the moment i'm in my uh, in my place where i live so i would imagine to not see this whole apartment complex but rather a much more different where we we have way more greens and at the same time integrated decentralized energy um but at the same time also a lot of the energy needs that we have starting from heating so i would imagine we we live in a different kind of buildings where our heating needs and the temperature maintenance needs are reduced probably a lot less maybe I, i'm not doing it from my personal laptop but we would have a collective hub of uh, communication uh usages where we are not using so much uh materials and minerals so probably um that I think these are some of the few things that comes on top of my mind when we, I, we try to imagine the utopia and if we have really won. So yeah, probably also way more diverse and way more insects and bees um, than that we see now. Yeah, I think I'd start there. Thank you. Hang, would you like to go next? Can you say again the question? The question is, um, in a utopian 2048, so in, in 30 years from now, um, if, if we actually manage to, you know, to, to, do the, to do the transformation we need to, we need to do, um, and we have a different energy system, what does it look like? If if you look out of you know out of your window right now where you live, for example, it could be you know it could also be somewhere else. It doesn't it doesn't matter where it is. Um, 
what can you see? Like it could be probably a solar panel on your rooftop or it could be, I don't know, people gathering to make decisions about the use of energy. Like what is it that, that would make this future utopian energy system? But like what it, what is it that would make it utopian for you? Like how can you tell it's not 2020 anymore, but a different a different world maybe? Um, I think that I can uh, say about my dream for Vietnam cannot be for Ethiopia because I don't understand the context. Uh, but in Vietnam, um, uh, I dream that by 2030, uh, we will have at least 30% of the renewable energy share in the power mix. And um, we also have a more share from the solar rooftop in the, in the solar um, section. Uh, because um, recently uh, in in my homes I have a, a the solar on my roof, and um, we also have a campaign uh, to help the people uh, from different part of Vietnam to understand the benefits um, and also the procedure of how we can make it happen. So I believe that um, with uh, the effort from uh, both the campaign advocacy and the change in the policy in the next 10 years, uh, we can have a, about a million uh, rooftop, million home with the solar rooftop uh, in, in our country. So that is the dream I draw and also I um, put the effort to um, make it happen. Um, that is also a part of our, the energy story change in our uh, system because it had to uh, improve the participation of the actor, different actor, and it also um, try to um, um, uh, to break the monopoly in the power sector. So I think it's a way to increase the democracy in the energy sector. Thank you. Yeah, we will definitely return to the question of um you know, democracy in the energy sector later on. Um, Leo, what's your vision? Ah, th thank you, Linda, and thank you for the question. I think it's it's always nice to have an end state in mind. Um, so when I think of, you know, this utopian society in our end state, I need to look at the context of where I come from, you know, the southern tip of, of Africa where we don't benefit from large amounts of access to energy as well as equality, especially in the way that energy is being distributed. So in order to reflect on what I'd like the end state to look like, I have to have a look at what's currently happening. I mean, the current uh, mineral energy um, complex in South Africa is very extractive. Um, it thrives off exploitation of workers and the community that surrounds those particular energy production lines. It thrives of exclusion because the way in which our energy infrastructure is built is meant to give energy resources to communities that are wealthier than those that are not. So if I were to look at an utopian state, I would drastically um, convert the way our current energy complex looks like to address issues of you know being very extractive. So ideally we'd move to more renewable energy resources and making sure that renewable energy becomes a more uh, bigger contributor when it comes to the energy complex, um, especially for the case of South Africa. I would definitely exclude all forms of exploitation. So this would mean that those who participate in the production of renewable energy would be either owners of the, 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 this mode of production um, and I would eradicate all forms of exploitation, especially when it comes to workers and workers' rights. So workers who work in renewable energy wouldn't earn a minimum wage, um, which is currently the case. They would earn at a living wage. Communities that surround energy, um, renewable energy plants would benefit from the energy that is being produced there. So what this means is that we would change what's currently happening in South Africa, where um, 
power plants are surrounded by informal settlements, power plants are surrounded by a lack of infrastructure, um, lack of water, lack of sanitation. So what we would have in this utopian society is that communities that these power plants are built on can benefit from those means of production. So there'd be access to healthcare facilities, Due to the participation in the renewable energy sector, there would be access to schooling, there would be access to roads, infrastructure, because the community would benefit. So there'd be a there'd be a large amount of beneficiation from the resources that come from renewable energy, unlike what we currently see right now. Um, if you ever had to come to South Africa and see some of the the, the energy uh, plants that currently exist, of um, coal energy or whatever the case may be, the surrounding um, the surrounding areas are filled with informal settlements. There's no schooling. There's no hospitals for the community to benefit from. So definitely, what you'd want to change is the issue of how um, communities benefit from the resources um, from the resources they are surrounded by. So you'd like to see greater beneficiation taking place there. You'd like to see less exploitation of workers' rights, um, paying workers the living wage, giving decent uh, work um, to, to, to workers so that we have a perfect um, sort of harmony between the environment and how we treat communities as well as workers. Thank you. Thank you to all three of you for uh, for sharing your your thoughts on this. Um, yeah, your first thoughts on um, on these visions. Um, um, so what what already came up in um, in your responses was the question of decision making, right? So part of probably part of what would make the energy system utopian utopian and or like you know, part, would, part of what would make it um, a dream, how Hang was saying, um, is the fact that we would have different decision-making processes over what energy is produced and how and under what conditions. And we would sort of democratize all of, all of that around um, the production consumption of, of energy. So, um, you know, Unlike right now, where we've got certain, you know, mostly fossil fuel companies producing energy for a profit, um, which obviously harms the climate and the environment and does also not necessarily lead to, you know, equitable energy provision for all on the, on the planet, but rather we would make sure that different, you know, societal groups like workers, like local communities, but also, you know, also a perspective of, of global justice would be factored into these, um, into this decision making, right? Of how much energy we can, you know, we can produce from what sources and so on. So, what what I would like to ask all three of you, um, and I'll start with you, Lebo, is um, if we imagine this this different system, um, and we would want to democratize um, decision making in the energy system, what, from your perspective, would be the role of of workers um, and perhaps also of unions, but I think predominantly of, of workers in this new system? Like, how would they um, engage? What is their role, and what is important to them in um, in such a um, yeah, in such a utopian energy system? So, so the role of workers, I would like to believe, especially when we talk about the issue of um, democratizing the way in which energy resources are currently owned is that workers would be part owners of, you know, the renewable energy, um, renewable energy plants, their their production as well as their 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 the manufacturing of of components. Why we say this is because you know when we change the structure of ownership, you also change how you know how how this the, how the sector begins to operate. Um, the exploitation that comes from the extractive industries is because of the for-profit motive. Um, you know, you're trying to make as much as possible of a of of, of a profit uh, by going further and further into the earth's surface. So, if you want to change in the way in which um, the way in which the, the the industry is currently operating, I think you'd have to drastically change the ownership 
of the actual industry. I think one of the things we say in the trade union movement is that we realize how detrimental capitalism has been in especially the industry of extractors. So we won't be addressing anything if we change one form of capitalism of another. Um, so you don't want to have this core based capitalism and then all of a sudden because we're going into renewable energy and renewable energy is a buzzword, we now create something called green capitalism. Because what we would do is the utopia wouldn't happen because we'd still have those we'd still have exploitation at play. We'd still have an industry that still seeks to 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 exploit um, its workers as well as community if we don't change them uh, the, if we don't drastically deal with the issue of ownership. So we definitely see workers, especially and communities, um, being part owners in this renewable energy. I think one of the points that I did make um, in the first in the first in the first sort of question that you asked about utopian society is that we also need to change the way in which the source of energy benefits certain individuals so we would have to change we would ch have to change the benefit structure completely um, communities would have to benefit because they stay in the communities where a renewable energy power plant would be built or they would stay in an area where the manufacturing of components of renewable energy would be built so they must be able to benefit um, from the processes that take place there. I think if we change the beneficiation structure, we also address issues pertaining to how unequal our societies are. Um, we change the issue of access. I think for us, especially in South Africa, access to energy is still a big problem. Um, there are still communities in 2020 who struggle to get access to energy and electricity. And we can't talk about a renewable energy system that benefits a certain group of people and it doesn't benefit um, the population at large. So we need to talk about how best to, to, to address those issues of access. So we definitely do see communities and workers um, playing a big role in the benefit structure, playing a big role in, 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 in the ownership structure, because if we challenge the ownership structure, we also allow workers a better voice um, when they, when in the actual sector. So issues of, you know, um, green jobs, equally decent jobs can be better addressed if workers are also participating in the ownership structure of the renewable energy um, sector. We can address issues of paying workers a living wage if workers are also involved in the ownership structure of renewable energy sources. So these are the fundamentals that we can significantly change if we see workers being a part of not just decision making to collective bargaining, but decision making through the actual ownership structure of renewable energy. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Hang, you work a lot with um, with communities, right, and with uh, civil society. So, um, and Lebo has also raised the, you know, the, the perspective um, or the stakes that local communities have in, um, in the energy system and energy production. Um, what is, from your perspective, what is, um, you know, what is important for local communities? How would, how should they be involved in, um, in a more democratic um, energy system? Like, what is their form of participation? What is important to them? Did you hear me all right? I think we lost her now. Oh no. Well, maybe her internet connection just fell dead for a moment. Um, I think we'll just we'll carry on and then get back to get back to her when she comes back hopefully. Um, so another question relating to to this. So um, right, there's the perspective of of workers, there's the perspective of local communities um, that are that are obviously important. Um, but Tony, perhaps from from your perspective um, and from a you know from a a climate justice perspective, there's, there's also, you know, a need for this future energy system, if we talk about it globally, um, 
um, you know, that also needs to be in a way globally just like we can't in, in certain places, like in the global north, for example, we can't just make decisions here sort of with people um, that like, you know, that there needs to obviously be a reflection of, of global injustice and also of past um, of past injustice. So is, is there anything that you can think of or that you could, you know, um, bring to the conversation that, that for you would make this future energy system just, um, you know, looking at it from a global perspective? Um, yes, I think should I continue or yeah, continue. It's good. it's good to get you back, Han. We'll we'll just get we'll get back to you in a minute. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sorry for interruption here. Yeah, Linda uh, continued the question uh, to me, and yeah, I will uh, give it back to you in a few minutes. Um, I think I want to start by bringing this attention to the fact that, uh, of course, the problem is the whole energy justice, if we can name it that way, is also again like, uh, yeah, we cannot repeat it enough or people could say it only you're always saying the same thing, but it's also again the whole colonial, like the early industrialized nation when it started by, of course, whole appropriation of different parts of the world. But at the same time, if you look in terms of the energy, we know that the like EROI of sources of energy, like for fuels, like energy return on energy investment, the ratio that tell us like how profitable it is or how much energy it takes to um, use a certain, uh, like extract a certain form of uh, fuel and how much energy we get in return. So this ratio is very important for um, to decide uh, which sources are efficient or, or giving us a lot of leverage. And for that case, we know at the beginning of, of like two, 300 years ago, when we started using coal the first time, the EROI for coal was very high because it, did, it was easier to extract coal. And the first coals that we were extracting in oil, it was much easier to get. And that has been one of the main sources of the whole industrial revolution or the whole growth of uh, Europe. And that has led the, the early industrialized nation to be where they are. And over this year now, the ER. EROI of coal and oil has also gotten much lower and now we are at a, at a position where now it's it's even over the next years we expect that the renewables will even become more um, profitable. So this whole thing, this whole early, like the first one to be able to go in and use and kind of capture that and that's already embedded in all this economic system is fundamentally then this question, it's already unjust, right? And then basically all can on top of that, uh, this is being used um, to like kind of establish a certain kind of lifestyle and this hierarchy. So this whole, this is whole embedded in our structure. So now from this perspective, now that even when we talk about that the new countries should now all the, uh, the new countries should also now need, have this need to move away from coal or natural gas, there is this injustice embedded in there as well because of course, because now we are facing with this, we have used up our carbon budget, so nobody could keep using energy. But at the same time, the fact that there were countries that still also have a huge carbon footprint and use this all this certain fuels composition at early stages, and now asking for other countries to phase out, and then the discussions you would see still even yesterday, like there was this discussion that all countries must have a similar kind of energy policy, even all these countries are not on the same stage and do not have the same responsibilities, fundamentally very unjust. And that we see each year at the COP discussion. So the whole discussion of reparation and what, how the early industrialized nation should take up the responsibility. So this whole thing would, in our utopia would change. We would need to fundamentally change that. And there would be a lot of probably giving back. And, and on the second hand, so that's the first idea around using the traditional the old uh, energy resources, but even now towards when we go into the renewables, already uh, Le, bon, Le bon has shared that um, just green capitalism wouldn't save us. And from that perspective, like we, we also see the cases of where we know that there are certain cases where EU, European Union is also then trying to mix, show the mix, energy mix as more renewables taking uh, like importing energy from uh, Algeria, Morocco, like North African countries where there is a, like this a scope of solar energy, but then the way it is being done, 
it is also again very oppressive and it, it disregards the community's need and also there is this whole uh, power relationship and this this could continue and this could even become problematic so we must also have this awareness that this is not what we are looking for like we see in terms of production eu's in the so one of the main major sources what takes up energy one of the big sources in most of the countries is industrial sector is one of the big sources of course there's the household there are um the commercial and transport uh, all these sectors but so eu actually has much less smaller percentage in terms of industrial sector but if you look why we would see because a lot of the industries are now in, in china in india so there's also so what, at what cost we can who can afford to have a greener energy composition that's also another lens so i think for from a global climate justice perspective we would need to be aware of all of these different lenses and put into a policy that is really just and responsible and we cannot that's why without talking about the whole colonial continuity without talking about this uh, having the chance to use the early like the energies we could not um yeah we we wouldn't be able to ensure a just climate uh, justice or cli cli energy policy and just the last point i wanted to mention is that there's no way that we could go there because energy policy is fundamentally very embedded with the way we live and organize and i go back to my first point of of the utopia that i was talking about that there we have to and of course the people like the part of the world where we are using a lot of energy we could afford to shorten down cut cut back on it we cannot be asking a different like major part of the global population in, in south asia and southeast asia in in um, africa in uh, in uh, south america that they cut their carbon consumption because there is the carbon footprint is really small the energy consumption is already very small so we also have to take like look look into lens from that perspective like who and what kind of lifestyle allows us to use this huge amount of energy consumption and who can effort to really cut down then where the responsibility lies then we would see the responsibility is also very um yeah it is bigger in certain parts and we really need to start making policies in proportion to the responsibility that we have thank you johnny um let me just briefly check if hang is back with us Hang, can you hear us or speak i see she's in in the room but muted i don't see her on camera either. Maybe we wait. Okay, well, it's probably some some internet connection trouble. Hang if you just uh, yes, now it works. Great. Yeah. No problem. Is it is it possible for you to turn on the camera so people can see you, or is that difficult for? Uh, um, because I think the the internet uh, is not good, so it's better. Yeah. To, it's better yeah. to leave it off. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry for that. Yeah. No problem. That's fine. Um, Okay, so Hang, what, let's just go back to the question um, I was I was asking you um, earlier, which is um, uh, which is that you do you do a lot of work with communities um, and uh, and civil society, right? And um, Leo has addressed uh, the question of workers and what their role um, would be. Tony has just talked about you know the the global injustices and how an energy system could be just from from a global perspective. Um, what is it? What is it from your perspective that that is important for local communities in this? Um, like how you you also mentioned um, the question of participation in the beginning. Like what is how how does that look like from your perspective when it comes to local communities and and their sort of involvement and engagement in in the energy system and in in decision making around energy production and consumption. Yes. Um, so in in my um experiences and uh, um, uh, observation I see that uh, in the future energy system uh, it should be restructured and uh, 
and design in the ways that allows the local people to participate in um, the policy making process. Uh, because uh, recently, like in Vietnam, uh, we transit from the um, centralized um, um, power decision making process uh, to more like a participatory. Uh, so uh, the local people are quite far from the policy process. So I think that is important to uh, reframe the structure to allow the people to participate to um, to decide um, the technology, uh, the energy technology that may affect their livelihood, and their environment, living environment. For example, for coal power plant, um, also this is a mix from very top level. But the, all the impact happen is on the ground, so the local people should have a, a right and also um, should be allowed to comment uh, or to um, to um, uh, how to say to to raise their voice or to influence the decision making process. At the same time, uh, the new system should also um, uh, enable the, their participant not only as a passive. Uh, consumer as uh, currently, but uh, they uh, can also be allowed to be a, um, uh, a producer. So I mean, uh, we support for citizen um, to become a, a producer and enlighten uh, the consumer. Um, it um, can use a solar uh, rooftop as an example for how um, to include the local people in the household to invest and benefit from uh, the new energy sources that um, can help uh, at the same time um, ensure the energy access, but also um, uh, improve the environment and contribute to reduce the reliance on fossil fuel. Um, and um, I also see that uh, a lot of change need to be happen on the, uh, the policy level and uh, the voice from the local community should be connected um, from different parts of the country uh, to make it uh, become louder and, and bigger to be able to influence. Uh, and we should um, um, uh, contribute and make sure that uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency uh, should become a major component of the new energy system, not as an, 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 an additional sources uh, as um, uh, currently and in the mindset of the, the planner or decision maker. And, um, uh, so um, because maybe our country is uh, different with the other, uh, so we have a very long history of subsidized uh, culture. So a lot of things need to um, change um, at the same time at the level of the awareness uh, for both this is a maker and citizen. So as a, a civil society, um, uh, we have to work um, and play multiple roles uh, in, in contributing for the um, um, new energy system. Uh, we have to do uh, awareness raising uh, for both uh, level, from the top to the down, uh, the bottom level. At the same time, we also have to connect with the other actors to do campaign and, and advocacy for policy change. And also, um, we to be able to convince the other to join with us, we also have to demonstrate um, a new solution to use it as an evidence for advocacy and for mobilizing the, the local people in the movement. And, um, uh, in the like um, advocacy effort for changing, uh, so a lot of things have to be done. However, we also face a lot of challenge because uh, with multiple tasks, um, and as a civil society, uh, we have to be um, very. Um, uh, how to say? Uh, sometimes it's very tension work for us, um, and at the same time, the administration work in in our context is also very very. Um, Straight, uh, very um, stressful. <laughs> so um, we uh, we know um, 
we share the vision where the, the, the citizens have a more right to participate, but we also to build and enable them to be able to recognize their right to be participate in a sector that we we'll consider is very technical and also very powerful uh, and uh, dry and driven by the, the industrial and um, incumbent um, group. So a lot of challenge uh, happen uh, in, in the coming time. Uh, but um, we work in coalition. Uh, we have a lot of coalition coalition between um, NGO um, and coalition between NGO and uh, business uh, and um, local um, authority, local government. So we try to uh, optimize the, all the avenue uh, that uh, opened uh, for supporting the chain. And uh, we hope that uh, with the effort from a different angle, we can open the the door um, and uh, make it uh, more and more uh, uh, supportive for the change. And uh, also uh, based on my experiences in uh, how we, we work with the local people and local government, we have a tool uh, called local energy planning. Uh, with this tool, we can uh, approach the community. We can also uh, be able to work with the local government to help them to increase the capacity uh, on the planning on open share mindset uh, uh, to a new one, to a new technology, new way of do, doing things. Uh, so with, with that tool, uh, it's very helpful for us uh, for awareness raising, for uh, uh, building capacity empowerment, and also uh, demonstration and advocacy work uh, at the local level. And with the result from this um, process, we can link up the effort on the local level to the national level through our coalition and alliance for advocacy. From my, my point of view as a civil society and community approach. Thank you. Um, so one, one more question um, that I had, perhaps also picking up on what Tony said um, and raised several times, um, which is the, the question of degrowth in, um, you know, in certain over-consuming parts of the world. Um, it's definitely that the whole degrowth conversation is something that we're trying to have in, in Germany, for example, or some of us are trying to have. Um, um, basically, you know, starting from the assumption that um, there are certain planetary boundaries that we need to respect. So, you know, we also need to put limits on our resource consumption um, in the global north. Um, and for you, Lebo and Rang, is that something that um, that sort of resonates with you? Is that something that you perhaps not not necessarily from the, for the context that you work in, but as sort of as a concept um, for the global north, which could also you know uh, much more drastically reduce emissions um, and also sort of you know make space for um, for emissions and and resource consumption in other parts, you know, without you know crashing through planetary boundaries. If you want to, if you want to go first, yeah, I'll I'll go first. Thank you, Linda, for the question. And I think that's that's one of the difficulties when we do our advocacy on climate change. I think everyone always asks about you know a global fair deal, and really what you described is what we would look as at as a global fair deal, where you look at a principle where you know in economies that have had such a head start um, when it comes to development and because of the head start you've had in development and the mechanisms that you've used to get to your development um, the consequences that you've polluted more um, and you've contributed to the lion's share of, 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 of carbon emissions. So everybody, especially in the less developed countries, um, South Africa is one of them and in fact the African continent in its whole. I think those are the conversations um, we, we, we look forward to because I think without a 
global fair deal, it's very difficult to get countries who are still playing catch up to come to the realization that, you know, we need to reduce, um, we need to reduce emissions. I, you know, it's outside of the space of trade unionism and, and, and how we participate in issues of climate change, but it, it makes it, it makes sense. And I think it's fair um, because it, it doesn't push a narrative that, you know, countries that are still in the it, it's running with this developmental agenda should remain left far behind. I mean, some of the issues that we grapple with um, in the in the global south are completely different to um, as compared to the issues that you grapple with in the north. Um, ours are, you know, are still about issues of access. Um, access to energy is is a big thing. Um, in, in Africa. Um, I think COVID-19 has just um, exacerbated that. Whereas in the North, um, you can have this wonderful Congress sitting in your homes and can be connected to unlimited amount of Wi-Fi and electricity and energy. And it's a no brainer for you guys. Whereas for us, the fundamentals are still missing. Let's not even talk about access to internet. Let's talk about access to energy. Let's talk about access to heating. Um, it's still a challenge, um, in, in, especially um, in the African continent. So when we come to these negotiations, I've seen the way that COPs um, 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 function. I think um, Madrid was also an example of this, where there's this illusion that we're all on an equal footing. And we're not. We're not on an equal footing. There are some of us who live in countries that are so far behind. I think if, if it, it would take for you to understand just how far we are. We, we, we're still struggling um, with the basics. And for us, while struggling with the basics, having to comprehend an idea that we also have to um, reduce our, our, our footprint, even though we understand that we definitely have to, because I mean, it's not like climate change will only affect the North and not affect us in the South, it will affect us all equally. Um, but the understanding is, we want to get to a point where we can grapple with these challenges, develop, and still um, reduce our our carbon footprint. I think if if we can, it's it's a very difficult balancing act, um, especially in the case of, of of the global south. I think in the north it's much easier um, to to kind of grapple. It makes sense. It's a very it's a linear process. Um, we're polluting more, so we should reduce our our consumption. For us. It's a case of if we reduce our consumption, we don't develop and we don't address some of the social ills that continue to, to, to plague you know, the global south. We have terrible inequality. Poverty is still a huge problem for us. Um, unemployment is at unexplainable levels. Um, formal sector employment is virtually non-existent in some parts of the continent, whereas the informal sector is continuing to, to increase. So while we're trying to challenge, while we try to grapple with all of those social ills, we also need to have in the back of our minds that 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 you know we need to reduce our 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 contribution to to fossil fuel emissions. Just before I move, um, before I give someone else a chance um, on the panel, I think if if cops are honest. Um, and we have a we have a situation where there's just a broad understanding that the African continent is is so far left behind, um, and that there's just there's just cause for us to 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 assist one another. I think you you'll find that you know our interactions around reducing carbon emissions even in the African continent wouldn't be so much of a touchy issue, because I think there's so much distrust among Africans that you know because now we're following the same trajectories that other countries used to develop, all of a sudden now we have to, you know, use less of our energy. So in order to 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 gain more of a of a of a trust um, from African counterparts or just basically in the global south, um, to, to deal with those trust deficits and for us to move um, to move this process of reducing emissions quite quickly along, I think we 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 have to do that with foresight of the challenges that countries in the global south have to deal with, and I think. Um, here the responsibility is for, for, for institutions as well as countries in the global north to basically assist um, wherever you can, especially when it comes to, 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 to countries in the global south, so that we can walk this journey together. Understanding that if for us to have a global fair deal, we need to address the elephant in the room, that the biggest polluters are the ones that enjoy the greatest development. Um, and it's the responsibility of those countries who enjoy the 
best development to take along those countries that haven't and to assist them with their developmental agenda as well and not to be so punitive to 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 african countries that are trying really to get the mass of their people out of out of poverty um and to get them in employment so that you know we can address their 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 bread and butter issues um just to just before i conclude that you know the biggest successes we've had in our deliberations on climate change, especially at, at the level of the workplace, is when we attach issues of climate change to bread and butter issues of workers. So if we don't make that connection, we lose the debate completely. Um, so if, you, if, if, if countries in the global north and institutions in the northern heavens here come with a, with a policy that seeks to punish an already disadvantaged quarter of society, you lose the opportunity to take us along with you. So I think if we address and we are genuine in us addressing issues of a global fair deal, um, I think it's much easier to push um, this conversation much forward. But if you do, if you do the opposite, which somehow it seems like that's what COP uh, last year's COP was all about, you will lose these marginalized groups. You will lose. You, you'll definitely lose the global south um, in its entirety. Thank you. Thank you, Lebo. So Khan has just put in the chat box that she has to leave um, now. She's actually already left because she has a, um, a journey uh, really early tomorrow morning. So she had to drop out. It's already, I think, uh, 11 o'clock, like 11 p.m. where she is. So um, she had to leave us. Um, so we've discussed sort of we've discussed what this you know future energy system could look like maybe we can spend the last you know depending on how much more we want to discuss 20 to 30 minutes and also depending on if there's questions from the audience um which you're always welcome to uh, put in the chat box um in the stream um we can maybe talk a bit about you know how do we get from here to there <laughs> uh, talk about strategy a bit um you know, and you can you can obviously build on what you you are doing in your you know activism or work or um, in your organizations and movements and networks right now. But you can also, you know, I think it would also be imp you know interesting for us to discuss um, what potentially those actors or you know societal forces um, could do if um, you know in sort of in. Um, not in 2020, maybe, but sort of in the years to come, and um, uh, yeah, in toward, towards um, mid-century and um, you know a utopian future. So um, I don't know, um, Tony. I don't know if you want to start. Perhaps if you look at you know where the the climate justice movement or movements, um, perhaps where they stand. Um, what are like what are your reflections on um, on what strategy could look like towards um, towards that you know future energy system like what is it, what is it that the, the climate justice movement still needs to um, you know develop or get better at or like what are strategies towards that goal um, could I quickly also because it comes with also connects with what um, you're asking. Could I also have uh, some uh, reflections based on what Lebo sh shared or said? Yes, definitely, definitely. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I, I wanted to kind of take that on and start from this position of, I think, if you see, or this gives us an idea of, of as Lebo was sharing, what a discussion's like in, in, in global, South or whenever there is a, this talking about climate change, if it's not connected with already people's like bread and butter, like then then they are losing people, or how the struggles are, how difficult it is for this balance and this, this crazy idea that there's also still need to re reduce our carbon footprint. Um, and from that point, I just wanted to add on top of what um, they've shared, I just want to add a bit more, saying that on top of that, it's. So the problem is fundamentally also on this narrative, this trajectory that was set by this early industrialized nation and that everyone else now needs to follow or this certain lifestyle, like the, the whole idea of good life or what it means, it is now has been set and everybody tries to now achieve that. And that is also a big part of the problem. And 
if you also stop and look that why, uh, uh, as Lebo was saying, like Africa is far, far behind and you have no idea how far behind we are. But then we also, if you stop and think, why is Africa so far behind? Because in the mainstream economics, in the mainstream discussion, it's always like, it's somehow always, uh, you would see either it's about the um, geography, it's about the climate, it's about um, certain uh, prevalence of diseases. That's how often it's justified. But there are studies also, if you go back and look into the history, like the fact that there were hundreds and hundreds of years that people were taken from this land. Like, And when you take away people from, from a land, and, and also often we know the history from the history of colonization that often the most developed parts of Africa were the first ones where, where um, the slaves were taken away from. And, and, and then they were also often the most, like the smartest people, or even when there was a certain form of centralization, the urbanization in, in whatever form was starting to form around the port areas. Those were the hotspot of slave uh, uh, slavery. And those were the places where this, the bodies were taken away from. So that, of course, fundamentally shifts how a country's trajectory is going to be like. And it, it, it not necessarily it stops, it actually puts back. So we see like how, while we talk about how certain countries, this whole history of uh, uh, like this industrial revolution, but before that, the whole ac accumulation through, uh, through you know, slavery and colonialization, it happened. So it not only progressed certain parts of the world at the cost of other parts, it also pushed it back. So it's not only that it was as if it was a stop and they have to just start from there. It's more like even and, and pushed down. So it's also again, and also even today, we know that it's not only that it happened. Okay, again, people could say it's it's hundreds of years ago and there are so many aid that still goes into Africa and there's so much money that still flows. And even today, there are these reports and that I also often use in, 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 uh, uh, like in my uh, like discussions or talks that this from global financial integrity report from 2016 that they clearly show if we try to look into the how money is flowing from where and what are the sources uh, for each dollar one dollar of aid that goes into african subcontinent there is 25 dollars that is flowing out in terms of um, illegal invoices um, tax um, like, uh, like not 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 paid taxes by international corporates and also there are the, so so um, and also the debt repayments. So there are all these channels where so in in reality it's not only that Africa already has to like it's not only Africa as well. It's also of course about uh, South, South. Like I would again say that the most countries of our global South is embedded in this relationship where it's like it's bleeding. It's a bleeding continent. It's not only as if they're struggling with the challenges. It's also at the same time it's actually feeding and it's supporting all the all the affluence that we see in certain that is growing and is a center in certain parts of the world. So I think as as um, Lebo said, to, to be really then honest about it, and then I come to the question that you were saying for the climate justice movement and what we are doing, if we are then really honest, we would expect that all of the discussion would really take this into account and start from there. But we of course see a lot of the discussion in Europe, the, the policies or even the, the parties that are, that are talking about climate and green energy, it's still about can we make we cannot we cannot make the car industry annoyed we cannot like the discussion here so so i want to also want to focus a like point onto this contrast like for a, a lot of the countries in the global south it's about livelihood if people would be able to eat or if people's homestead will be washed away by flood or how how what is it going to look like for millions of people but in countries of global south it's often how we can keep happy certain industries and of course uh, workers who work in those industries and how we could still find navigating and we see a lot of the lobbying power are into government like we know the recent this coal uh, like the coal policy that was passed and then uh, like the whole for the whole movement it was like a slap in the face like we have been on the street for so long and there was clear oppo opposing every nobody wants the, the coal phase out should be on 2038 but then that was the case and what is the reason and this is where also we stop and think what are the reason and how has it been? And even though all of these NGOs who have been working also for so long, the environmental uh, big NGOs and a lot of the uh, the energy policy, all of even though it's it has been there for so long, why are we still not doing enough? So I think in that, I think there's of course clear like that we see of the 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 people and also I want to reflect on Lebo said that we are all like the impact of climate change will be same all over the world. It's actually not even going to be the same. The countries in like the sub-Saharan Africa, it wouldn't be even be arable that it wouldn't be the food won't be able to uh, possible to grow food if we are going in the same trajectory in in 20 years it, it will be impossible in um 
uh, in South uh, Asia as well, this is going to be the cases and the impacts we already see is unfolding. So impacts are also not, not the same in, in Europe, in, in Russia, like there was this kid, we were doing an event and a few days ago, there was this, even a child, like he, he, there was, he was a three year old and he was saying, he started up saying, saying that for us, we are just going to have warmer, uh, warmer summer. Like that was, he was, it was his reaction. And then, then of course, like, yeah, so, so for, uh, that, that's the concept, like in Europe, it's probably going to be warmer summer, of course, not so simple, but so it's also the impacts are not same. And that's why we see how the policies that are being taken are not the same. The people, we are not really taking up collective interest as priority. There's still a lot of division of interest and that, that all those goals and affect the lobbying and the policymakers. And of course, there's still about this whole idea of keeping self-interest or, or in this boat that we are really on together, but not on the same stage. And there are this effort to really still, everybody's trying to be on the same, the best spot when the boat drowns or something. I don't even know what the, the mindset is, but that's how it looks like. And this is where, so in this case, the climate justice movement, I would say probably we need more and more awareness in this terms of like really coming up then what we are aiming for and then have a bigger vision because do we really see what's coming and, and what and because there are still certain countries have more resources and more power and then really start taking up the responsibility that could go and impact the whole decision making and, and the interest and start thinking beyond the, the small like very small group interest but really about more collective and how that could look like and push for in that direction you can stop there Maybe, maybe to to both of you, um, if we talk about strategy, um, what do you, from your perspective, what are, um, you know, what are the societal alliances that we need to that we need to forge? I think that goes sort of both ways. At least from, you know, in the German context, it's always been, um, you know, it's, it's it's a fairly recent development that there's, you know, at least more conversation between, you know, the environmental, the climate movement, whether in its institutionalized form of, of NGOs or actually, you know, for example, the Fridays for Future movement and actually trade unions um, and the trade unions, the unions in Germany have not necessarily been, you know, the first to call for, um, you know, for climate policy. It's that they've, they've rather been, you know, uh, forces to perhaps you know go go slow um, on that transition, obviously for you know for for obvious reasons. Um, and I'd be interested to hear from both of you if if that's something sort of that you that you also see in the context that you work in. If if those new alliances or perhaps not new, but sort of forging in this context, if that's something where you see progress, perhaps because I I guess you know if we're aiming for this really you know for for a just um, energy system or any sort of just future, um, you know, it really, it really needs those broader alliances and making sure that it's, you know, just from, from a lot of different angles in a way, and also obviously not just talking, not just the climate movement and workers talking, but also other sort of societal groups and, and other, um, or people being affected um, from different sort of forms of oppression really. And yeah, so if you could just reflect on it, Libra, you're still muted. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about uh, sorry about that. I'm actually trying to get my son um, to go into another room. Um, uh, so on the issue of alliances, they're very important. I think um, we've benefited greatly, um, especially in the International Trade Union Confederation, where we've been able to build alliances amongst our trade union partners across the world. Um, even having said that, we would have to be careful of trying to adopt a one-size-fits-all for all regions or adopting one of these cut-and-paste things that we do that oh, if it worked for Germany, it must work for um, a juxtaposed South Africa, which, which is not necessarily the case. I think in our comparison in especially energy policy, um, in energy transitions, I think, yes, we can learn lessons from, from each other, but we also need to be aware of the specific challenges that each region faces. Um, Tony is quite right. Um, the, the, the challenges of climate change will disproportionately affect poor 
countries as compared to um, countries in the in, in the north. So 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 we need to be mindful of the fact that each country is facing a number of challenges um, that are specific to that country. Um, so even in our development of energy policy, um, we must be mindful of that. So yes, we do aspire one day to get into a process where we can look at, you know, the, the drastic reduction in extractive industries and fossil fuel um, industries. But we must be mindful of the fact that on top of, you know, playing catch up in the global south, we also are plagued with high levels of, of, of poverty. And how do we do this catch up and how do we do decarbonize in such a way that we can address issues of poverty, especially in the in the global south. So so alliances are important in that regard because there are clear lessons that we can learn from you know partners across the world. Um, it may not be necessarily um, it may not be necessarily in 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 how the policies look like um, across the world, but it could be in who you've worked with and how you've been able to get maybe your government onto the table to have a negotiation on energy policy. How you've been able how you've been able to bring trade unions um, to the table. How you've been able to um, discuss with enterprises on how best to move um, the discussions on, 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 on energy and, and energy policy in a collective manner that I think we can learn um, a lot from when it comes to, you know, our deliberations and our collaborations with, with partners across the globe. Um, we've had, we've, we've benefited from those greatly, especially with our, our collaboration with um, the International Trade Union Confederation. I think, um, and we're starting to learn this um, in South Africa, that, you know, we will never push for energy policy um, in such a way that addresses, you know, issues of a just transition, that addresses issues of, you know, low carbon, um, lowering our carbon footprint if we don't work well together with civil society formations. Um, I don't doubt the power of trade unions across the world, um, but I do think we're better collectively. Um, and this is something that we're learning. I think we're, we're moving in a trajectory, especially in our policy discourse, where we are wanting to engage better um, with civil society. Previously, we used to, especially on issues pertaining to climate change, we used to have a serious um, uh, disagreements with our civil society formations. We would feel that, you know, civil society formations will want to prioritize, you know, the environment, um, um, and, 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 and that would be their own key focus. Whereas with us, we want, you know, issues of workers' well-being as well as livelihoods. And I think the more we've had our engagements with civil society and the more we've collaborated, we, we can agree to one thing. Yes, we want healthy, we want, we want an environment for our future generations to exist on. And then secondly, we want to also ensure that, you know, communities have livelihoods. I think those are things that we can agree to. And just with those two fundamentals, we can come to a bit of a compromise so that we can, you know, come together, collaboratively advocate um, and educate our structures um, when it comes to issues of, 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 you know, energy policy. Just maybe to go back to the point that, 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 we, that I raised um, earlier in, in the other questions that you asked, Linda, is that, you know, when you when we make uh, issues of climate change and energy policy appeal to the bread and butter issues, not just of workers but of that of communities as well, we can understand that at the at the root cause of it is that people just want to be able to live in a society where they can reap the benefits of their hard labor. Um, they can be able to, you know live their lives in such a way that is decent, live their lives in such a way that, you know, they can be able to achieve, you know, the, 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 the basic standards of wellness and livelihood. And if we can prioritize that at the bare minimum, I think it's, it's so much easier to bring communities as well as workers, trade unions together in order for us to push for energy policy that seeks to transition workers as well as community to a low carbon economy. I think, you know, the, the I've been in a couple of meetings where I hear the, the term just transition gain so much more traction than what has been the case in yesteryears. But because at the, at the center really is that everybody just wants justice 
I think that's 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 the beauty about the term. It's it's us wanting justice and wanting to transition in a way that has justice for our communities as well as for 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 for, for workers. Um, we don't want the current energy complex that we we currently have that's so reliant on fossil fuels, so reliant on exploitation, so um, reliant on you know extractive. Um, we want to be able to move in such a way that we address issues of justice for communities and we address issues of justice for workers. What that justice looks like, I think we must still have a conversation about, um, especially when it comes to civil society as well as trade unions. But if we agree that we want justice um, and we want to move in a way that bears justice for, for, for our communities as well as for workers, I think we, 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 we are able to move on um, we are able to move well um, with this discussion. I mean, just as you know, a final point. Um, one of the things we always talk about is that you know, before you report to work every day and you become a worker, you come from the community. So we can't divorce the two. The two remain one. So as we deal with issues of you know climate as well as the just transition, we must continuously advocate for the community because that's 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 who we are before we report for work. We are part of the community. So that's why it's so important to collaborate so well with civil society formations. And then once we've mastered that, then we can collectively pursue collaboration between our governments as well as enterprises to see how we can jointly create energy policy that can move um, our countries forward. Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much. I think those were almost, you know, perfect closing words, but I will definitely, there's definitely space for Tony to share some reflections um, on, you know, on strategy around, um, you know, movement building and alliances if if you want. But yeah, but those will be the, the closing words, I think, because we're almost um, approaching the end of the of the panel. You're still... You're still muted. Um, yeah, I was saying that on, on that point, I think I would definitely second what Lebo has said. And those were really yeah, good, strong closing points. And then just on top of that, I think it's, I mean, from one point, I think there's also certain kind of, um, not stagnation exactly, but what would be really more more effective and how we could keep up with the with the time, the fact that we're running out of time, like just not the panel, but <laughs> with the climate crisis. Um, so I think there probably, so one thing is definitely that even to, to keep in mind that even within each government, so each country, there are a lot of factors that are at play and a lot of forces, but as long as we could globally keep on finding fellow like solidarity and fellow minded like forces coming together and at the same time within countries start starting a discussion and, and, and what um, uh, seconding what Lebo said like people at the end of the day people really want to like to, to, to there is an appeal of justice and everybody would want something that feels fair for everyone and, and from taking that as a base of conversation it's definitely possible to start building bigger alliances for movement so not only across like glo global like globally but also of course within countries and that that i think that would could be a very strong um next step also for a movement in germany movement in in like each of the respective countries and yeah i think that would be probably our way or key to win or not Thank you very much to both of you, Libo and Tony, and to Han, um, who has left us a bit early. Um, I suggest we close here. Um, thank you very much for joining us and for having this conversation, um, all of us. Um, and yeah, hope to stay in touch and continue the discussion and the struggle. <laughs> and yeah, thank you very much.